thank you all for, for being here. I will um, try to present to you um, some of the work, but also some of the rationale why we are doing this type of, uh, this type of work, coupling low field and MR, and I'll try to define the low uh, in a few slides, and high field and MR, which is um, you know, maybe the, the standard of, um, of our field. Uh, so to do that, we have instruments, or actually one instrument that uh, uh, couples a uh, standard uh, conventional high field uh, NMR system with NMR at a significantly lower field. Um, but before I start my, uh, my presentation, as I will present some of the recent work we, we have done together over the last couple of years, I would like to say a, a few words uh, on our a friend and colleague, um, Konstantin Ivanov. Uh, it's only 10 days ago that uh, we learned that, um, that Kostya uh, died. Um, he was um, uh, a close colleague and, um, and a friend whom um, uh, I met for the first time uh, maybe in the middle of the, of the previous decade uh, when he came to Paris for a hyperpolarization uh, conference. He um, was really... Uh, uh, well, a very fantastic scientist, um, a really brilliant uh, scientist, very curious, uh, interested in uh, an extremely broad range of topics from magnetic resonance to spin chemistry, EPR, NMR, almost all hyperpolarization techniques, uh, clever anti-crossings, uh, singlet states. It, it's very, uh, it's impossible to make uh, to make the list in a, in like a, a short uh, short discussion like like this one, uh, he, he was really interested in many of the aspects that uh, uh, I and, and my colleagues uh, are developing at, um, at ENS. And, uh, and um, he, he drew many bonds uh, with, uh, with several of us, including Jeffrey and uh, even more with Daniel Berger. Uh, we've done many things together, uh, working together uh, on different um, uh, different projects, exchanging students, and uh, and lately editing um, uh, together a special issue of magnetic resonance. So um, it, it was it's been shocking news. It, it is uh, it's very sad to um, to lose uh, a colleague, um, and we will we'll try to do our best to to continue. Uh, his uh, his work and uh, and his achievements. Um, that having been said, let me um, try um, to maybe start with the with the core of my of my of my talk. Um, so it's easy uh, to to see uh, somehow a, a correlation uh, and maybe partly even a causation between the, the development of, uh, of high field magnets and the, and the tremendous progress of NMR over the last few decades. Uh, as you can see, there is an almost, uh, in, let's say, constant increase uh, of, uh, of the highest uh, available magnetic fields with uh, uh, now, uh, particularly last year, the advent of the first commercial 1.2 uh, gigahertz system. And in the Meantime, during the last four decades, uh, the progress of NMR has been has been quite fantastic, and part of it is really due to the fact that we have highest magnetic field systems. Uh, one of the reasons why high magnetic fields are uh, really completely uh, changing uh, NMR compared to let's say the lower fields of uh, four decades ago uh, is uh, the um, the great sensitivity gains that uh, we have from higher magnetic fields, and here you can see. A nice figure coming from uh, coming from Brooker and a very nice review they wrote uh, 15 years ago um, about the evolution of the sensitivity of the, really the most standard uh, uh, sample on uh, ATL benzene, and you can see uh, this this steady increase that is definitely not uh, definitely not linear with the, with the field. We can see that the increase comes not only from the field, but also from what comes around the field. Uh, in particular, here you can see how two decades of work have increased dramatically the sensitivity of a 500 megahertz system. And then how uh, the advent of cryogenic probes have also significantly increased the sensitivity. So altogether, higher magnetic fields lead definitely to higher sensitivity, but they are not the only, uh, it's not definitely not the only progress of NMR, even conventional NMR, and even um, 
um, yeah, conventional in MR, even without hyperpolarization. So uh, where does this gain of sensitivity come from? It comes from many, uh, many aspects, and I, I will only discuss a few of them here on this slide. Um, the first thing is uh, really at high temperature, the Boltzmann equilibrium, and uh, the fact that the polarization will be uh, proportional to the energy of the interaction with the magnetic field. And so uh, your polarization depends on the magnetic field where you polarize and the geomantic ratio that uh, the nucleus of the nucleus that you start uh, your pulse sequence from. Then uh, for detection, uh, the, you have uh, a signal that will be proportional to the magnetization. And this uh, magnetization uh, is uh, proportional to the polarization and the geomantic ratio of, of the nucleus of yeah, the nucleus that you detect. And then you have the induction in the coil uh, that contributes, um, that depends on the magnetic field, uh, both for um, signal and for the noise. And so here you end up with a, uh, just a square root uh, dependence on the geomantic ratio of the nucleus that you detect and uh, at the magnetic field that, that, you, that you detect. And another aspect that is quite, uh, that is quite important for sensitivity is also um, the transverse relaxation time of the nucleus that, that you detect. Yeah, if you have long T2, then you can detect the signal for a long time and you, 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 have, you end up with more signal. Okay, um, so now we expect somehow for experiments that are run at a single field, uh, dependence as a factor, um, as a power three half uh, with uh, respect to the, to the magnetic field. Okay, another thing that improves with, uh, with higher magnetic fields is resolution. Of course, um, of course you, you separate uh, the, uh, the signals in Hertz uh, much more linearly with the, with the magnetic field, but you also simplify uh, the spectrum. And here is a very nice uh, simulation that I picked from Glenn Fisi's very nice blog, where you see that uh, you have some significant uh, complications from strong couplings at uh, let's say lower magnetic fields of the order of 60 to 100 megahertz that, and you have a transition to a very nicely behaved conventional textbook uh, NMR spectra at, uh, at high magnetic fields. So more resolution and simplification in a way that we expect somehow to be uh, linear with the magnetic field. And now if you look at a really complex real life sample, uh, here, uh, I want to show you a, a quite a complex uh, spectrum from human urine and comparing even a medium field, yeah, the 500 megahertz is high field. You can see here in this region that uh, actually the, the aromatics, for instance, are still a, quite a complicated uh, forest of peaks at 500 megahertz, when here uh, at, at 1.2 gigahertz, uh, this spectrum is beautifully resolved. So clearly there is an, an advantage not only to be at high field, but to be at ever increasing magnetic fields. One illustration that I really like uh, when we look at the field dependence uh, of resolution is uh, the, the case of um, quadripolar nuclei and uh, the effect of, um, of magnetic field in this case is uh, coming twofold first from the reduction of the second order quadrupolar interaction, and then of course the linear, uh, the linear effect, just simple of the field, leading to, uh, in some cases, a beautifully and maybe somehow deceptively simple uh, spectra for, um, for quadrupolar nuclei at magnetic fields that are, well, not quite commercial yet. So uh, let's come back to solution state and MR and maybe what uh, I, most interested in, which is uh, biomolecular solution state and MR. Uh, the, the progress in terms of field and RF and probes and isotopic, uh, isotopic uh, labeling methods and methodology have made that uh, maybe 30 years ago, the state of the art was working on a, on a small protein like ubiquitin, when today the state of the art has been actually for about a decade now, even more than a decade working on a very large protein assembly, such as the proteasome, where you see beautiful high resolution spectra like in this, uh, in this very nice application from the K-Lab. But are high magnetic fields always better? 
uh, on there are some things that are getting worse with the magnetic field. And I would like to argue that, um, yes, there are some things that are getting worse with, uh, with higher magnetic fields. But before I talk about low magnetic fields and how they're uh, somehow uh, better or worse, I would like to define what I mean with, uh, with low magnetic fields. Uh, this has a, a definition that low magnetic fields that covers uh, easily uh, 10 to 15 orders of magnitude of, um, of magnetic fields. So I would like to, uh, to say where I, we will go together and where I will not, uh, I will not go today. So if, if you're in nano Tesla range and, and below, uh, you have, of course, the area of Zilf, uh, zero and ultra low field and MR. I will, I will sh actually show you uh, one application that doesn't come from our group, but comes from our nice collaboration with, uh, with Konstantin Ivanov. Um, so this scale goes actually quite far. I'd say I would argue that zero is quite far on the logarithmic scale, uh, but this is not, uh, not the type of low fields that I will mostly discuss today. Uh, the, the micro Tesla range corresponds to the uh, where you find the Earth's magnetic field and is uh, definitely the a range where you will uh, find beautiful work uh, done in particular on vice versa cycling relaxometry, which covers uh, the entire micro Tesla and mini Tesla range. Um, <clears throat> in the mini Tesla range, uh, you'll find actually the, the fridge magnets that uh, probably most of you have uh, on, um, at home. Uh, and also, uh, again, a, a lot of work from uh, vice versa cycling relaxometry. When we reach around the Tesla, uh, comes uh, come benchtop systems that are typically between uh, between one and two, between one and two Tesla, and uh, those systems are um, actually maybe closer to what I will call uh, low field and high field NMR would put between let's say 400 megahertz, 9.4 Tesla, and 28 Tesla, which is uh, maybe the, the maximum available, let's say easily available uh, magnetic field. Um, but I have heard some colleagues, I won't give names, who will call 9.4 Tesla low field uh, NMR. So for in the frame of this presentation, I will mostly show you low fields that are, let's say, moderate fields in the, in the range of what is uh, usually um, used for benchtop, uh, benchtop systems and, and simple relaxo relaxometry systems. So, well, low field NMR has some advantages and some, some clear advantages. It's, it's convenient. I mean, it's bench, you have benched up systems, so you can really put them on your lab, in your lab. You don't need to, to go out of your, of your lab to run your NMR spectrum uh, if you're uh, doing uh, organic uh, synthesis or in or looking at inorganic systems. Uh, it's easy to integrate. You can put it under the hood and monitor a reaction real time. It's actually even more portable than going in a, in a far, um, far areas uh, that are organic chemistry synthesis uh, labs. So you can really bring low field systems down um, like a kilometer uh, looking here, like here uh, at uh, the, the water content inside oil wells um, as is done with, uh, with, rela with uh, relaxometry techniques, or uh, you can, uh, uh, you can do as uh, the group of Bernard Brumish has done with the NMR mouse and run experiments on hot springs. Um, here, I think it's in Yellowstone National State Park, uh, which uh, is uh, actually a, a great place for uh, uh, all of us to project ourselves um, now that we've been confined for a full year. Um, there are some other advantages of, uh, of uh, working with moderate fields. If uh, you work on a on a 600 megahertz or even a 1.2 gigahertz system, uh, running broadband NMR methods is actually quite challenging, in particular in the context of solution state NMR, where our probes are not able to stand magnetic um, RF fields that are able to cover such a broad range. So this is actually uh, uh, clearly uh, a challenge of, uh, of very high fields. When at one Tesla, the entire proton spectrum fits in two kilohertz. And so it's actually quite easy, I would say trivial to, uh, to run broadband experiments at such, such a field. Um, another aspect that is actually, um, that can get really much worse at high fields um, is relaxation. In particular, 
every relaxation aspect that scales uh, with the magnetic field. And chemical shifts on isotropy uh, is clearly uh, um, an, a quite dramatic contribution to, to relaxation at very high magnetic fields. So here in this plot, uh, we show uh, the field dependence of the transverse relaxation rate of a carbonyl carbon, 13 nucleus, um, inside a, a protein with correlation times that range from a couple of nanoseconds all the way to 100 nanoseconds. So if you want to run some triple resonance experiments uh, at high field on say uh, a medium size protein, the 30 kilo Dalton protein, go to one gigahertz, um, one gigahertz spectrometer. And uh, you actually have T2s that are of the order of 10 milliseconds. It's already quite challenging because several experiments actually include some inaps that are longer than that. And so the, the loss that you expect from transverse relaxation will be quite dramatic uh, at, the, at this field that is becoming quite accessible. Now, if you have a 100 kilodalton protein and you're like, well, for this, I need to go to a 1.2 gigahertz system and you want to run experiments that involve some coherence transfers on the carbonyl, then your T2 is going to go down to about two milliseconds, meaning that you will really lose all your magnetization just in a single inept, uh, inept step, transfer step. But if you look at this graph, you see that if we were to move down the sample to somewhere around two Tesla, for coherence transfers and would benefit from much more favorable relaxation rates. For a 30 kilodalton protein at 85 uh, megahertz, uh, you expect a T2 of the order of 200 milliseconds. That's very long and very comfortable. And even for 100 kilodalton protein, you have a T2 of 70 milliseconds, uh, minimizing considerably the loss of magnetization during in depth transfers and into evolution in indirect dimensions following uh, potentially very high resolution, quite high resolution spectra. Um, okay, so le let's continue in some other advantages of, um, of low, field, uh, low field NMR. Um, obviously, um, uh, low fields are fantastic for uh, looking at any type of molecular dynamics. Um, if, you, if you consider uh, relaxometry in, in particular covering uh, several orders of magnitude, maybe five or so uh, of magnetic field allows you to, to cover uh, many orders of magnitude of, of time scales of motions. And, and this is a fantastic probe that uh, we have hard time to compete with if we work only with, uh, with high field NMR. Uh, one nice illustration uh, I, I like to show is the, the work from Bertil Haller, looking here at fast field cycling relaxometry of uh, deuterium in heavy water uh, in solutions of proteins that have been immobilized so that so as there is no overall tumbling. And in this case, you can access the microsecond internal dynamics of proteins by looking at the time scales of the exchange of, um, of water molecule between the bulk and the, uh, the inner water sites inside the, inside the protein. Accessing uh, timescales that are of the order of up to, uh, to five microseconds. So low fields are very instructive also, and not just uh, a convenience where some properties are uh, slightly more favorable. But there is one, uh, one type of application that I, I would like to, uh, to spend maybe a, a few more minutes on. It's the, the case of uh, chemical exchange. Uh, this is a, um, a spectrum as is rarely published. Uh, usually we do not see uh, protein HSQC um, 2D spectra that look that bad in publications. But this was in a, in a very... Uh, clear context where there was clearly an evolution of the, the quality of the spectrum with temperature. But quite often, uh, we end up with spectra that look like this, and we don't really know what to do. Uh, we have uh, clearly um, some systems that, uh, that are just too heterogeneous and have some sort of dynamic heterogeneity uh, that lead to extremely poor quality uh, correlation spectra. 
And this can be driven actually by, by chemical exchange when you have, in particular, when you have significant populations of ex exchanging species. And one thing that we uh, actually um, somehow are getting wrong uh, when we look at textbooks is uh, coming from actually the, this, uh, this uh, little animation that I'm going to show you. What we're used to is seeing simulations with a given, uh, given frequency for, uh, chemi for chemical shifts. And we're changing the kinetic constant of this exchange phenomenon. And so we have nice and narrow peaks at, um, with the slow exchange. And then if the exchange becomes, is accelerated, then the peaks broaden. They broaden very much. You end up at certain kinetic constant at coalescence where they merge into a single peak. And then you need to actually um, increase the kinetics of exchange to get a very nice narrow peak with a with very fast exchange, yeah, with an exchange rate of the order here of 10 to the power five. Uh, I mean, this is absolutely true and this is fine and this is a very good way to look at chemical exchange. But it leaves us with an idea that uh, if we get in the slow exchange regime, then everything will be fine. Because in the slow exchange regime, peaks are narrow. And actually in a slow exchange regime, peaks are not necessarily narrow. Um, in particular, when um, we go into the slow exchange regime by changing the magnetic field. Uh, Michael, it may be a good time to take questions. I currently have a question from uh, Sayel Alouette, who asks, for carbonyls, in which field do you have better resolution um, and signal to noise from the examples you show? So what, what's the optimal field for, for carbonyls? Um, so it, it, it depends. As you see, the, there is an optimal of the, of the transverse relaxation rate, maybe of the, around two Tesla. And so for, um, for this, I would uh, expect that if uh, what you want to do is um, um, coherence transfer, uh, then you, two Tesla is a very good field. And if you want to look at resolution, you have to uh, include uh, not only relaxation, but also the linear increase of, um, uh, of uh, separation that comes with the magnetic field. And so this leads necessarily to an optimal field for resolution that is somewhere in between uh, what, uh, but between two Tesla and, uh, and a typical high field. Um, I, I do not have uh, a general uh, response uh, to tell you whether it's five Tesla, seven Tesla or, or 11 Tesla, but it's, it's definitely not um, uh, 18 or 20 or 28. So this image is, is, is great, but it gives us an idea that slow exchange means uh, narrow lines. So actually, if you have a system where you have coalescence actually at a, quite a high field, you, maybe you could think that increasing the magnetic field would lead to a, a somehow a, a spectrum that has nicer qualities. And so um, here, actually, this is what happens if you start with 600 megahertz. You have coalescence maybe around eight or 900 megahertz and you continue to increase the magnetic field. Indeed, you will increase uh, the spectral separation. So getting to finally uh, the slow exchange regime. Now we're above one, one gigahertz, uh, which 1.2 and we can dream of uh, running this experiment all the way up to 1.5 gigahertz. And as you see, you can actually separate two peaks. So you, you actually have more information but if you look at the frequency scale on the x-axis, you see that actually these lines are extremely broad. And so uh, clearly in this case, uh, you will have not only no increase of resolution, but in particular, no increase of, uh, reson of coherence lifetimes. And so any complex experiment that involves uh, coherence transfers will actually um, be, uh, as bad at 1.5 gigahertz as it was at, uh, let's say, a more moderate field such as 700 megahertz. On the other hand, um, 
if we start from say at 900 megahertz and we decide to lower the field how is there a cost to lowering the field or is it actually better well let's see so now you decrease the you decrease the magnetic field and you see that actually we continue to increase the intensity even though we take into account the decrease of intrinsic sensitivity have really nice inten in more intense and narrow fields at 100 megahertz 900 and it's only when you go further down well sure that um that you you end up with um let's say significantly below 100 megahertz that you actually start to lose in sensitivity so for systems in exchange it can be as good or even better uh, somehow to go on a bench top system as it is to stay at high field and of course the the dream would be to keep the sensitivity of high fields, but to get the gain of um, uh, let's say the, the gain of narrower lines um, coming from evolutions at lower fields. And so this is this simulation. We start really from the from the baseline, and now when you decrease the field below 100 megahertz, now it becomes extremely narrow, and um, and very very favorable. Okay, so idea, the ideal would be to be able to run experiments that are both at high field for you know, resolution when we need it, sensitivity, and low magnetic fields when it makes sense, when there is chemical exchange, when there's a more favorable relaxation or uh, other advantages. And so to do that, we actually partner almost 10 years ago now with Brooker to develop, um, to develop such a system, starting from our very conventional 600 megahertz system with uh, a cryomagnet, uh, a room temperature probe, and uh, a nice tray field that covers about three orders of magnitude of magnetic field in the bore of the magnet. Um, the first thing you need if you want to manipulate uh, nuclear spins is uh, to have slightly more, to have reasonably homogeneous uh, magnetic field. And this was done uh, using um, a set of ferroshims that are uh, rings of soft magnetic material and that leads to uh, a compensate the field along the axis and lead to a plateau around 0 0.33 Tesla. Now we need a probe to manipulate nuclear spins and uh, Booker developed a triple resonance uh, probe with the z-axis gradient that really allows us to do as, as complicated and sophisticated NMR at low field as it does at high field. Okay, and, and the RF also had to be uh, integrated in particular um, in being able to reach frequencies uh, as low as three or one megahertz. Uh, this was not possible in the advance in the advance um, uh, console that we had, and it's, it's not uh, possible, at least uh, on the catalog, on the, on the Neo console. So once this is done, you have a low field spectrometer sitting on top of a high field spectrometer. And um, as you all know, we're working on um, other applications, particular relaxometry, where we have uh, we're using a sample shuttle that moves the sample very fast between um, uh, on top of, um, of our high field magnet. And so we are using that to couple the two, um, the two centers. Um, so let's come back to that idea that at low fields, we're actually um, more broadband than at high fields. And I give you the example of one Tesla because one Tesla is a conventional um, benched up uh, field. Um, and, but here we're at 0 0.33 Tesla. So 200 megahertz, uh, 200, sorry, PPM in this case, uh, fit in only uh, 700 Hertz. In this case, it should become really trivial to run experiments that would be otherwise quite difficult to run at high field, in particular, for instance, broadband carbon toxi. And this is the experiment we run. So um, now you'll see our pulse sequences include two lines for each nucleus, one uh, high pitched somehow at high field and one um, uh, at, low, at low frequency. So in this case, the, se the sequence is very simple. It, it's like a very simple a toxi experiment, except that we're moving the sample to low field where we apply uh, a typical pulse sequence for isotropic mixing. And the results were beautiful actually, where we saw all uh, possible correlations uh, in uh, these uniformly labeled amino acids. So in this case, you see in blue, the spectrum uh, here from leucine, 
where we see correlations from the two meteor groups all the way to the carbonyl through four bonds. And uh, in the fin in phenylalanine, it's even better. We see also all correlations, including uh, from all the aromatic, um, all the aromatic uh, carbons all the way to the carbonyl through the C alpha and the C beta that have chemical shifts that are quite far away. And this would be very hard, if not impossible, to do uh, at, at high field. If you zoom in, you see the, the quality of the correlations, and it's a, it's a, it was a very nice experiment. But maybe one thing I would like to discuss um, is that uh, at some point you could say, well, if you're at low enough a field, then you have a strong coupling. And so you don't really need to uh, apply any isotropic mixing sequence. You should, uh, the toxic experiment should work even without pulses at low field. So we tried this and, uh, and it works quite well. You can see here on the right, uh, you can see that we have good cross peaks within the allophatic region of, of leucine and uh, within the aromatic region of phenylalanine. So it doesn't, uh, you don't have, uh, you still have a spectrum that fits in 700 Hertz with scalar couplings that are of the order of 50 Hertz. So you cannot have broadband mixing, but you can have actually some, some decent toxin. And we're like, okay, well, this is, this is due to strong coupling. And it turns out that um, it, it's not, uh, a couple of years ago, um, Ivan Zukov uh, visited us uh, from, uh, from Alexandra Yurkovskaya and, and Kostya Ivanov's groups. And uh, we tried this very simple experiment. Um, we did a selective inversion of the carbon delta two in, uh, in the leucine sample and moved the sample to 0 0.33 Tesla where we let it evolve for a variable duration before coming back to high field for detection. And here you can see that there's nothing coherent in this evolution. All you have is relaxation of uh, C delta two and the C gamma and the C delta one. And what you have actually is cross relaxation within the system, of, this system of nuclear spins. It's actually surprising that you have such efficient cross relaxation and it's possibly due to the fact that we're in a concentrated solution and uh, we have maybe some small aggregates of, uh, of leucine. Okay, so, but that was surprising because we, you know, if you look at the chemical shifts, we're definitely in a strong coupling regime at this, uh, at this uh, frequency. So the reason why uh, we were not in a strong coupling regime actually comes from the fact that we have protons there. And it's the scalar coupling with the protons that prevents the carbon homonuclear system to uh, be uh, actually in the strong coupling regime. Let's say in the interaction frame of the carbon-13 proton intera uh, scalar coupling interactions, the, um, uh, let's say the zero quantum part of the carbon-carbon scalar coupling Hamiltonian is not secular. And so what thing we could do to verify, to verify this is to run the same experiment, but now to apply decoupling on protons at low field. And again, nothing special on carbon-13. And under those conditions, as you can see, you have nice current evolutions that are much faster than cross relaxation. And that, uh, that do correspond now to the, to the strong scalar coupling regime. And so um, this is actually um, something that we, we, I, I really like because it shows that even though we're, we are not, you know, we're trying to keep um, a high field point of view on, um, on the spin dynamics that uh, happens in our systems, keeping the field to an um, uh, area where Zeeman interaction still dominates, we, we still have some, uh, some interesting, interesting uh, spin dynamics that take place that are uh, usually not uh, what we would expect from just um, high field NMR mindset. Um, but actually, if proton scalar coupling, proton carbon scalar couplings are um, really what is limiting us, um, then uh, why not uh, getting, you know, getting those heteronuclear scalar couplings to also be strong couplings? And this is um, this um, uh, Kostya came back uh, a few months later with this brilliant idea to go under Zulf conditions, and this is my uh, my only Zulf slide where you do exactly the experiment we did before, but now you go down to uh, a magnetic field that uh, is in the nano Tesla range. 
And in, under those conditions, both homonuclear and heteronuclear scalar couplings are in a strong coupling, uh, strong coupling condition. And you have actually end up like here in this uniformly labeled lysine sample with an experiment where you have toxi that is not only broadband, but it is really across all NMR active species. And here you can actually see all the correlations that uh, you would expect from this sample between all the carbons and all the protons. So you could argue um, if you see zero correlation, this is a useless experiment. But if you see all correlation, this is not a very useful experiment because if you see all correlations, you don't have a lot of information of topological information. I would argue that um, against this, but uh, in order, order not to waste too much time, I will just show you one application where it like, actually makes sense to have all correlations in small molecules is the case of mixtures. In case of mixtures, you can uh, we apply of toxi to, uh, to a mixture of isotopically labeled small molecules. And as you can see here, we obtain uh, here the fingerprint of, um, uh, of different small molecules that we can identify in this, in this mixture. Um, I have what, 15 more minutes or so? Yeah, we can also keep going a little bit longer as the service okay. issues. So. Well, yeah, Th thank you very much. Um, so let, let me continue because um, here in, in these applications that I showed you, we go to low field only for um, uh, to have coherent evolution. But maybe we can go to low field and actually uh, label chemical shifts, run multidimensional experiments where different dimensions are recorded at different magnetic fields. So in our case, the, the challenge is that, you know, we, we're at a reasonably high magnetic field and we are in the bore of a commercial high field magnet. So our sample that is about two centimeters long has a difference of, uh, of chemical, of let's say of magnetic field in PPM between the top and the bottom of the, of the sample that is about 200,000 PPM. So to reach a range where we could run high resolution uh, experiments is actually, uh, has taken some effort. So part of the, uh, of the challenge was actually most, the most part of the challenge was actually solved by, uh, by uh, broker engineers, introducing these ferro shim systems, uh, shim foils and room temperature electric shims that have uh, taken down the uh, inhomogeneity to about 10 ppm. So uh, here 10 ppm is uh, still definitely not high resolution range, but it's a range where you can apply RF field manipulate the magnetization, then use spectroscopic tricks to recover high resolution. So one of these tricks that is quite easy is to uh, use a zero quantum homonuclear coherences, and in this case, carbon-carbon uh, zero quantum coherences that are completely insensitive to, uh, to inhomogeneous fields. So we took, uh, we started from an inadequate experiment and we just uh, changed it to be an inadequate experiment only to look at zero quantum coherences. In this case, on the small um, isotopically labeled uh, sample of glycine, we uh, can actually obtain these correlations where we need to zoom in on the pigs because they're so narrow on such a broad range in order that low, at low field, we had uh, a width that was uh, of the order of 0 0.1 ppm, which is about 0 0.3 hertz. I mean, it is really, uh, really quite high resolution. Of course, uh, all of this uh, we, we're really doing to apply this to, uh, to uh, let's say, proteins and, and other biomolecules. So in this case, what we like to record are heteronuclear correlation spectra. In this case, what we had to do is somehow uh, tweak the uh, the Hamiltonian in order to actually have a compensation of um, B not inhomogeneities uh, between the proton uh, offset Hamiltonian and the carbon uh, and the carbon offset Hamiltonian. So uh, this was done with the use of um, of just a few pi pulses in the sequence, and in this case, uh, a nice thing is that we can process the spectrum in order to. Uh, actually retrieve 
the uh, carbon 13 uh, the carbon 13 uh, chemical shift and not a zero quantum uh, chemical shift that would be more difficult to read. In this case, we actually have uh, slightly uh, uh, more, uh, slightly less good resolution, uh, which is probably due to, uh, to molecular diffusion during the sequence at low field. But you see the peaks are at the expected position from, um, uh, from a high field conventional correlation experiment. Okay, so I, I told you that um, chemical exchange would be terrible at, um, at high field and could be actually much, uh, much more manageable at, at low field. So let me give you uh, one example. Uh, in, in this molecule, you have one methyl group here and uh, two methyl groups there. And, and this one will be our reference and this methoxy will, will uh, be a, a strong, nice signal that doesn't exchange. And these two are actually in, um, in exchange, actually in, uh, in slow exchange at a moderate temperature, uh, but quite not far from, uh, from coalescence, as you can see from how broad the peaks are, when this is uh, the very uh, strong signal from our reference medium group. And if we increase the temperature, you can see that at some point we reach a regime where we are actually in, um, actually are in um, close to the close to coalescence and at, at the point where um, in a couple of hours uh, on the concentrated sample at high field, we don't see any peak, any uh, signal for, for these two exchanging, exchanging metal groups. Okay, so uh, now we could imagine running this experiment where everything that involves carbon-13 coherences is actually at, uh, located at low field. And in this case, we would expect to be, of course, in the fast exchange regime, but also to have uh, much narrower signals. And this is uh, what we obtain applying this uh, two-field EJQC experiment to this sample. We recover here a, a nice and reasonably narrow signal for these two exchanging meteor groups. And if we increase the temperature, uh, then we are just further into the fast exchange regime and it becomes uh, easy to observe these signals that were just uh, completely lost at, uh, at high field. Um, so we actually applied uh, this experiment also to a sample of protein and, and I will admit that um, 0 0.33 Tesla was not designed to, uh, was not a field that was chosen as an optimal field to, um, uh, to run this experiment, but more, let's say, an engineering compromise. Um, so it was challenging to run just even a spectrum on ubiquity, uh, but the conditions are actually so far from optimal that we have great hopes uh, that uh, more optimized magnetic fields will lead to a, a beautiful quality, a beautiful spectra. So in this case, uh, we uh, applied this uh, two-field JQC experiment to our, our sample of uh, to a sample of ubiquitin with specific labeling of isoleucine delta one positions, and you can see that we have uh, actually quite poor signal to noise and a few artifacts, but we do see all the peaks where we expect them. Actually, the experiment worked better than we expected because um, actually the the theory uh, behind uh, relaxation of uh, multiple quantum coherences um, that um, is uh, mon used is one that was designed for um, high molecular weight systems at high fields where we are definitely in a slow tumbling regime. But in this case, ubiquitin at 0 0.33 Tesla, we are not in a slow tumbling regime and we had to revise somehow uh, the um, description of relaxation in, um, in this system. So I'll, I'll just browse just quickly through, uh, through these slides, but uh, we've identified actually one part of uh, the zero quantum coherence that actually has very slow relaxation, even at, even at uh, low magnetic fields. And this work was uh, um, uh, championed by Nicolas Boulicoulon, Samuel Cousin in collaboration with uh, Jean-Nicolas Dumez. So in this case, you see that we reproduce very well the line width. Uh, here with the red lines, uh, we reproduce quite well the, the, the blue experimental line width. Maybe I'll take two minutes just to show you what we would like to do 
uh, in the future when we have our next generation of two field system. If that's okay with you. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Um, so in in this case, I don't know if you saw this uh, this uh, article that came out uh, about two years ago uh, from um, uh, Ari Artanari, Nico Takoshi, in collaboration with Ilya Kuprov, looking at uh, TROZI on a quite peculiar spin system uh, composed of one carbon-13 and one fluorine-19 on fluorinated aromatic side chains. And um, uh, actually, th this is a big deal because it, it's very hard to observe these aromatic side chains in proteins. And here you can see a comparison on a, on a medium to large size protein where you compare the state of the art before this work, which was a ch trozy with this uh, cf trozy experiment. And you see better resolution and better, and better sensitivity for this, uh, for this experiment. Um, and indeed, uh, what uh, was shown and based on, uh, on Ilya's nice uh, simulations uh, is that there is a, a very strong relaxation interference for carbon-13 in, uh, in such a spin pair with uh, just a, a perfect CSA tensor that leads to a, a great in, uh, destructive interference between CSA and dipole-dipole relaxation mechanisms, leading to uh, an optimal field of the order of 10 Tesla, 10 to 15 Tesla, for carbon-13 in, uh, in this pair. The thing that is actually much less optimal is fluorine-19 relaxation. So it, it's really optimal to look at carbon-13 in this system, but not at all to look at fluorine-19, in particular, if you go to a large protein, something with a correlation time that would be tens of nanoseconds uh, at high magnetic field. And you can see here that we end up with relaxation times that usually belong more to the domain of solid state. NMR than solution state NMR. So in this case, clearly th this is not optimal at all to have any coherence on fluorine 19 at high field. So you see that the optimal of relaxation rates on the other hand is, um, is quite reasonably low uh, even for a large molecular weight uh, system at magnetic fields that correspond to about one Tesla that are far from, um, let's say that are what you encounter on a benchtop system, but clearly not something where you want to put a large molecular weight protein for sensitivity reasons. So we decided to, uh, to simulate what uh, such an experiment would be on a hypothetic system that hopefully will be out in the next couple of years. Um, so in this case, we run an experiment where we polarize here carbon and fluorine at, uh, uh, at high magnetic field. Then uh, with quite favorable longitudinal relaxation, we uh, send us the sample to, uh, to low field where uh, we run everything that involves uh, fluorine coherences. So both chemical shift evolution and um, evolution of the scalar couplings at low field. And then we move back to high field for detection where we only have coherence on the carbon and, and only just two pulses on fluorine. And in this case now, we can actually optimize the, uh, the magnetic field in two dimensions, the low field and the field for the low field, the field for high field. And you can see here that um, we, we see a, a clear advantage to be at, uh, uh, at low field for the part that involves fluorine coherences and at high field for the part that involves carbon-13 coherences. In this case, the optimal couple is somewhere between two and three Tesla for the low field and somewhere around 20 Tesla for, for the high field. So uh, our idea is to uh, try something that, uh, that would look like this. Uh, this is, a, of course, a kind of a, a concept and nothing exactly uh, what, we're going to, what we're going to do, but a system that would couple our 600 megahertz system, for instance, with a, with a two uh, not <coughs> second uh, magnetic center at two Tesla. And if we have this system, uh, we can compare, simulate what we would expect from uh, the high field TROZI recorded at 600 megahertz and the two field TROZI recorded at two Tesla and uh, 14 Tesla. In this case, uh, first let's look at um, resolution and um, for fluorine 19, actually you would, you would expect that because the field is seven times smaller, even if relaxation is slightly more favorable, you don't expect uh, very good resolution, but it, it's not the case. 
uh, here you can see that actually resolution is, I would say, slightly better at low field in, sp in spite of the fact that the, the magnetic field is seven times lower. Now, in terms of sensitivity, uh, this is actually much more difficult. Uh, it depends on many, many factors. Uh, but uh, the idea here is to compare two experiments that are run on the same system with the same probe at high field. So uh, the only things that change is really what happens uh, for the spin system during the pulse sequence, which is uh, hopefully much more uh, manageable to simulate. And in this case, we've tried to compare uh, to simulate the entire experiment, including recovery delays and including proper simulation of T1 during recovery delays. And this is what we obtain uh, comparing the signal to noise for a system with a correlation time of 100 and second, which is somehow in between the half proteasome and the full proteasome. Uh, and, and you see that basically we, we expect something that is uh, around the noise uh, for the signal for the one field proxy experiment when we expect to have something that will be, um, that will be accessible to, um, to probes with a current state-of-the-art sensitivity uh, with, a, with a two field experiment. So, um, well, that, that's it. Um, hopefully I, I, well, um, I made you discover if you had not seen it before, uh, our approach of uh, two field and the mass spectroscopy coupling let's say a conventional moderate field, moderate to low field uh, NMR and high field NMR in a way that is really beneficial. And that allows us not only to, um, to explore interesting spin dynamics, but also uh, to, uh, to obtain uh, sensitivity and resolution gains in, uh, in real life systems. Uh, with this, we can, uh, we can run correlations where we actually run mixing sequences at low field or uh, even chemical shift labeling, even on small proteins. In the case of uh, chemical exchange, uh, we can even recover some signals that have just disappeared under high field conditions. And we can uh, develop some methods that are really optimized for, uh, for two field systems on, uh, hopefully we'll apply that uh, within two years uh, on, um, uh, real life and state of the art uh, complex large macromolecules. So many people have contributed to this work um, in uh, I'll start in Paris with uh, the, the students uh, who have been involved uh, from the beginning in that story, uh, Samuel Cousin who has traveled the world since then, uh, Pavel Kadejavec who was a postdoc and who uh, is now leading his own group in Brno, uh, Cyril Charlier uh, who is uh, now already back in France, um, uh, Nicolas bolic coulon who did uh, almost all of the theoretical work that I showed you today, uh, and is about to graduate this summer. Uh, Milan Zashla worked on uh, some, uh, some applications and uh, quite ironically is now working on a 1.2 gigahertz system in Göttingen. Baptiste Adou prepared some samples uh, with us and I have Lots of uh, fantastic colleagues in uh, Paris, including Ludovic, Carlier, Guillaume Bouvigny, Philippe Lupessi, and Geoffrey. Uh, several um, ideas and applications I showed you uh, come from a very really nice collaboration with our friends in Novosibirsk, uh, including, of course, Kostya, but also Ivan Zukov, who came for a few months in Paris, Alexandra Yokovskaya, and Alexei Kiritin, who ran the Zurtoxy experiments with Ivan that I showed you. Uh, some of the theory that I showed you, in particular on Meteor Groups, we've developed in collaboration with Jean-Nicolas Dumez. Uh, we started this two-field adventure uh, with, uh, with Dimitri Sakellariou. Um, and clearly, uh, all, of, uh, all that I showed you, all the experiments that I showed you, have only been possible because we collaborated with many people at Broker. Um, and we are going to continue, actually, for the years to come. So this is exciting. Uh, and two people have really contributed now over a decade uh, of collaborations is from Max Tiburn and Torsten Markets, and we'd like to single them out. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the methodology as well as the, uh, the theory behind it. Um, so we've got uh, sort of quite a few questions. Um, so I'll start with a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, um, we get a similar sort of enhancement in, in sensitivity in certain systems if you're in solids, um, in particular where you have homonuclear dipolar interaction. Um, um, so, 
Yes, you. I mean, of course, you you can imagine to run um, uh, this type of experiments in in solids. Actually, it was done way before us, uh, in particular by the by the Pines group, um, uh, going all the way to uh, to Zilf conditions. Um, in our case, we are really interested in running high resolution NMR, and so in this case, if we were working with solids, it would in, in imply moving uh, a sample uh, during magic angle spinning. So uh, this is fun and there are lots of ideas to play with around this, but um, I can tell you that it's already difficult with a liquid state uh, system and, a, and a, a sample that we don't spin. Uh, but I hope that maybe in 10 or 15 or 20 years, uh, me or someone else will be able to show uh, this type of application in solids. Okay, well, that's something to certainly look out for. Uh, so we have a, a question from uh, Walt Mazewski, who asks, um, can the low field effect be used to explore new dozy regimes? Um, would you need gradient coils in the low field probe, or could you actually use the shuttle um, in place of a gradient pulse? Um, so I, I yes, yeah, so I've been often asked, um, if we can use the just the stray field gradient for dozy, uh, in this case it, it's not trivial at all uh, because it, it requires to um, control the the timings with uh, extremely strong precision. So I would say th this is very tricky. However, something that uh, that can be done, and I I even um, I even wonder if um, this is something we had discussed with Kostya, but I don't know if they, they did it um, uh, in Novosibirsk or, or not, is that some systems actually uh, where you don't have a lot of dipolar couplings, but you have a significant CSA, relax um, really much more favorably at low field. And in this case, uh, a nice uh, application of dozy would be to be able to reach uh, diffusion delays that are very long. So uh, actually, the, this is uh, this is something that um, uh, it's quite uh, quite interesting, and I, I hope that if it has not been done, we, we can do that in the near future. Okay, thank you. So I guess related to the, the issue of uh, con controlling the shuttling time um, and that being being difficult, uh, an, an anonymous attendee asks, "How fast is the shuttle time, um, and can you start the measurements as soon as you shuttled, or, or is there a delay for stabilization?" Yeah, it's actually a very good question. So uh, uh, our current system um, is a pneumatic system. We actually shoot the sample at a speed of about uh, 10 meters per second. So it, it takes off the order for 100 milliseconds to move the sample. We can go down to uh, a little faster if we, uh, if we push it a little more. But the order of magnitude to remember is 100 milliseconds to move the sample between the two many centers. Um, uh, now, uh, can we uh, can we um, uh, pulse and or detect as soon as we as we arrive? Uh, no, it's a pneumatic system, so uh, you you actually arrive at your destination at maximum speed, and then you have a shock. So it's it's actually very nice to you can hear all the delays uh, by just hearing the shocks coming from your spectrometer. Uh, but it, it means that there is a little time for, for damping. So it, it has to be of the order of 100 milliseconds at high field, for instance. Uh, it's more problematic at low field where relaxation is faster. So we try to make it as short as possible at low field. Uh, but um, clearly for some samples in water, for instance, uh, we've, had, uh, we've tried some sequences where we had uh, it's a poor water suppression and we can definitely see some strong artifacts coming from the vibrations. Um, however, yeah, with, the, with the current sensitivity we have on biomolecules, we don't have these artifacts there. They're lost in the noise. Okay, thank you. Um, so as Sif asks whether the magnetization of high field is retained at low field, is the field shuttling adiabatic? Um, yes, so yes, we're, um, uh, we would lose all interest if we were moving so slow that uh, we would be uh, at the Caribbean at, um, at its position. So uh, yes, we, we, uh, we, well, with most systems that we have, we keep the, the high field polarization all the way to low field and back to high field. This is, uh, this is somehow the, the, the point. But with some systems, I mean, relaxation would be too fast and we would not be able to, uh, to use this system. Okay. 
so uh, kind of summer actually I had the same question and so were there any specific examples where non adiabaticity was a, a problem? Uh, um, yeah, recently we put a, a paramagnetic uh, sample, like a, a complex with a paramagnetic ion and um, uh, to explore the field dependence of relaxation. And, and clearly that was not, uh, it was not the most favorable sample to try these ideas. Uh, we, we basically uh, were losing all our polarization. And, and clearly, I mean, it, if you are take iridium, uh, at any point during the experiment, then you lost all the information uh, from before that point. And so you, you cannot run uh, any, uh, any useful experiment other than just pulsing back at high field for a 1D spectrum. Okay, thanks. Okay, so a uh, question from Claire Dixon, uh, who asked, with the right transfer shuttle system, could you use the high field and low field at the same time? Um, if the, the pulse sequence was compatible or, or would the RF pulses um, be too close together and, and sort of interfere? Ah. Um, I, I, uh, the, this is a, a good question, but I, I would only, um, I will have to, uh, to go visit some, um, some physicist colleagues to, uh, to be able to have a sample that is at the same time at high field and at low magnetic field. Um, uh, but uh, the, yeah, there is something physical that I mean the, the sample can only be at a, at one magnetic field or at a distribution of magnetic field if the field is in homogeneous. But we we can pulse at high field and at low field in the same pulse sequence, uh, which I I think is already uh, quite fun. Uh, but we we cannot pulse at the same time at two different fields on the same sample. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, and so I think final question, um, if anyone else has a question, you know, uh, post them now or, or hold a piece. Um, so was there any benefit to having more than two fields? Is, is two fields sort of optimal or, or can more be done? Uh, the sky is the limit. Um, no, um, it, yeah, we, we have thought about the three field experiments and um, yeah, there, there can be ways where you, you know, you do something that is more optimal at one field and something else is more optimal at another field and something else is more optimal at high field. Uh, but uh, we'll try to, to make better experiments at two fields before we, uh, we explore that. But uh, please um, join, uh, join us um, and join this field and, uh, and uh, enjoy the exploration of uh, as many fields as you want.